Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue. Um, this is the talk that I'm here for, if you're here for this too. Please stick around, if not, feel free to make uh, your way out. Uh, we're here to talk about analytics. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to get a quick sense of the room for all of us so that we can have more focus, you can get as much value as possible out of this talk. Uh, how many of you currently are able to log into Google Analytics and see some stuff? Okay. How many of you feel confident in the stuff you're looking at? <laughs> Half raised hands for confidence are good enough. But we are going to get your hands raised high up by the end of this talk. Um, there will be two free things if you stick around. Um, one, some tips and tricks at the end that you can take away and use. Uh, and second, I will be uh, giving away a, uh, a handsome Kowloon t-shirt to uh, the first person who can answer a small quiz about this talk. All right, let us begin. Mm -hmm. A little uh, thought provocation. Um, a, lot's, a lot's changed in the game. Um, voice is a really big thing. Some more or less recent uh, statistics have uh, taught us that about 20% of the searches right now are uh, voice searches on Google. Um, this, is, this is pretty important. So this affects SEO a little bit, but um, you can tell a little bit of a, a story here. Um, which is the purpose of analytics, ultimately. Um, and uh, of all of that content, a lot of it's local. Most of the traffic on the internet is bots. A little bit of math, a little bit of reconceptualization that's possible um, is the power of, of analytics and, and storytelling and ultimately harnessing your data and being able to tell a story about it uh, is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but first, a little bit about uh, us. Uh, Calmuna is an agency uh, that works with mission-driven organizations. And uh, these are some of our clients in the higher education space. We work a lot with uh, nonprofit organizations, a few uh, Canadian institutions, uh, front and center here. Some civic tech, uh, some municipal government. Uh, we are based in Oakland, California, and uh, soon, uh, more officially, in Toronto, Canada, where I was born. We very much believe in sharing. This is an open source community, after all. And we do that at conferences and camps like this. Very happy to um, be here with you today, despite the jet lag. And uh, we also believe really strongly in the Drupal community and uh, make a decided effort to try to activate it uh, on the occasion of Drupal 6's ultimate demise and its end of life. We organized a New Orleans jazz style funeral through the streets, uh, the streets of the city. Uh, it was a fabulous event. Hundreds of people came. Uh, Drees was there. We had talks and served some cupcakes out of a coffin. It was beautiful. <laughs> Uh, to this is the the Kalamuna balloon, which uh, also perished in this uh, in this the perils of this event. And uh, we are also really keen on uh, getting to the heart of why we're all here. You know, we we do all this technical stuff, but it's for a reason. We're putting the technology at the service of cause, a cause that we believe in, and we all have different causes uh, that we support. And recently, we've. Uh, tried to activate our booth presence at events. Uh, this one is at, at Bad Camp recently. If you have not uh, had an opportunity to attend the Bay Area Drupal Camp, I uh, highly recommend it. It's a, it's a, it's a great event uh, in, uh, in Berkeley, California. And uh, so our, our team voted on uh, three nonprofits that they wanted to support. And for everyone who visited our booth and wrote a postcard to an elected representative, uh, we donated uh, money to each of these three organizations. Uh, whichever one they selected. It was a great opportunity to um, use that space to not contribute to landfill and make a bit of a difference and have some conversations about why we're here 
uh, not just about how we do things. Um, which is what we're doing in all the sessions anyways. Right? Um, and at Supercon, we um, did something similar, but used the opportunity to um, plant trees. So for every interaction uh, individuals had at our booth, uh, we planted one tree and uh, were able to contribute a small forest back to the wild uh, the space where the wildfires were devastating uh, Northern California. It's a little bit about us. Uh, my name, by the way, is Andrew Malice. I'm the CEO of Caluna. Um, often forget to uh, put myself in the mix. Uh, we're here about you. We're here to talk about you. We're here to talk about analytics. Why are analytics important? You know what? Uh, what are we? What are we here to to, to talk about? Um, Analytics are about measuring outcomes. And uh, why? Um, well, we want to empower stakeholders with the power to make decisions and for those decisions to be informed. And uh, we also want to know, in this quest to do good, how much good are we doing? You know, you make a great website, everyone's happy, or maybe exhausted by the end of the process. And, and then, you know, there's a celebration, but why did we build this thing? It was for a reason. It was to gain more traction, um, sign people up for a newsletter, or change, the, uh, change legislation, or um, serve a, a local community. How do we measure those things? It's important. And, Ultimately, you know, I am a novice at this and learning more, and I find it's kind of an interesting time to share what I'm learning and try to make that knowledge more accessible. Um, I've learned a lot from our senior analyst, uh, Vadim, uh, who's based out in Aurora near, near Toronto. And uh, so I'm here to relay a little bit of what I've gleaned over the last, uh, last few years uh, working, working in analytics. Um, but before we start, let's just take a moment to think about the power of analytics and what kind of stories they, they can tell and, and how they visualize information. Um, there, are, there are different ways, you know, you can just look at numbers and percentages and statistics, but uh, it's powerful to show uh, data visualizations to understand um, what, what's going on. Um, this is a form of analytics, it's tracking user behavior on a website, it uses a, a tool uh, called Hotjar, which is a little script that you can install on your website, and they have a free offering. You can put it on your homepage, for example, and track the first thousand visits for free. And what it will show you is uh, where people are hovering their mouse, where they're clicking, and how far down the page they're scrolling, um, which can be impactful. Just one thing I found out after we um, had our site done is that if you're a nonprofit or a charity, they give you a free account for that's um, that's fantastic. Like the, the expanded new friends accounts for the Good show. Um, the other nice thing about Hotjar is, is you can go back and, and play the sessions and see kind of real time what the interactions are on the, on the site and how people are scrolling and clicking and how long they're taking to scroll down that page, um, which, which is kind of nifty. Where's their mouse going? Here's uh, an example uh, visualization of, um, uh, there's a little plugin that Google Analytics has, it's called Page Analytics. It's okay, you know, but it does some cool stuff for, for it puts some overlays over all your links and shows you what percentage uh, of the total page clicks are present. Now, in this case, we were working with a university and they, they had this button, uh, which is the main purpose of the page. Uh, and uh, we were able to really signal a, a design flaw uh, here uh, because this does not look like a button and people are not clicking on it. Therefore, the purpose of this page is not really well served. Um, now, you can get data from other sources as well. You don't have to just install Google Analytics and rely on it completely. It can't tell you certain things. Um, here's an instance where we were working with a client and we had a lot of uh, patient data. It was for a, clinician, a clinical um, practice. And so we had addresses of all their patients and um, threw that into a spreadsheet um, and reverse geocoded the addresses and dropped some pins and clustered their audience in uh, on a map. 
and they're based in San Francisco, uh, but their audience was like spread out all over, all the way to China. And, and these are people that are going to get their teeth cleaned. Uh, I don't think they travel uh, all, 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 the, all that way. Um, and so what we identified by visualizing this data was that many people hadn't changed their address, that the mail the, the institution was sending was, was going overseas and, and the bills weren't getting paid. So um, not something we were looking for at the time, but that emerged out of the, out of the data uh, just by looking at it a little bit differently. Um, Surveys are a powerful tool as well. Uh, you can only analyze the data that you have, and if you don't have the data that you need, well, consider going out and getting it. Uh, this was a survey that we conducted for another university uh, in the discovery phase, uh, asking people how often they engage with the website. And what uh, the pattern that emerged is that you know faculty and staff are most actively on the site once a month, and graduate students are on there about once a week. Those are drastically different patterns, and when you're thinking about audiences, audience segmentation, or where your key messages are in your design process, um, maybe if you have a, like a, an important announcement that is, is for faculty, like the website's not a place to put it. Maybe you need all those little like cubbyhole mailbox slots that they check once every six months instead. Um, Another way of visualizing data, and one that we'll talk about a little bit later, are dashboards. They help to centralize that information and make it more understandable and, and comprehensible. This is an example dashboard for a client uh, that we produced. And uh, a, a little bit of the, the power here is that you can, you can focus on, on just the, the KPIs that, that you're looking for, the key performance indicators, and sur surface those and track those. Um, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but, but the, the power here for this particular client is, is their conversions are all about uh, sales. They have events and they're seeking ultimately to have people participate in them. And at the end of the day, all of those ticket sales add up to, well, a certain amount, if you average it out for every visitor, uh, like 92 cents per, per session, which is pretty substantial. You, if you start to think about it, every single person who's coming to your website is, is worth about, you know, a buck, not everyone converts, but it changes the value proposition of digital and, and the work that we're doing um, in, as being less of an expense and, and more of an investment. And I think that's a really powerful conversation to be having, uh, especially now, um, where there is a lot more receptivity to the engagement that technologists can have in a strategic approach in, uh, in websites, more so than just as executors. So ultimately, you know, analytics are going to help you understand what's working, what isn't working, so you can adjust your and course correct and start refining, uh, refining your approach. Of course, if you are tracking the right things. Before we get into some 201 stuff, uh, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Start with the 101 and ease you guys in. Define analytics um, because, well, this is what we're talking about. Uh, and, and so analytics is it's the discovery uh, interpretation and communication of meaningful patterns and data. But we're, we're going to talk more specifically about, about digital analytics, which has to do with uh, the collection, measurement, and analysis, visualization, and interpretation of digital data that is illustrating user behavior on websites or applications. But I would encourage you to think about this before you undertake any major analytics project. You know, it's a bit of an existential question, but like, you know, why are we here, right? Why do we have a website? A lot of people go into their analytics and they're like trying to find the information in there that's going to somehow, you know, they're, 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 you're in there with like a flashlight trying to find the answer to a question. What is the question you're trying to answer? What is the business value of your website? What purpose does it serve in your community, in, in, your, in your context? And are you try, what are you trying to achieve with it? Understanding that and working backwards from it uh, helps a lot to identify what you should be tracking and what kind of plan you should be uh, coming up with. Uh, when I last checked, I logged into Google Analytics and you know there's that little sidebar menu. Um, I opened it up, there were like seven new beta features. There's 115 menu options inside of Google Analytics. You can literally like get lost in there for hours, maybe not even finding anything substantial. If you know what you're looking for though, We'll talk a bit more about that when um, you get some stronger answers. Little, uh, little more uh, nuance. Getting to 201, 
102. Uh, want to talk a little bit about user session, sessions and page views. Um, they are important uh, principles. I like to use this metaphor um, that I've lifted from uh, a source here on the, the data box uh, blog um, to help illustrate the difference between these, these three concepts. Uh, if you think about a shopping mall and how people behave in a shopping mall, you visit, maybe there's a couple different malls, each mall is like, a, is like uh, you visit a mall, you, you go around, you visit a few other stores, and um, you know, how does that translate to a website? Well, each uh, mall is, is like a session that you're visiting, and in that session, you're going to visit different pages, which are like different spaces in the mall, right? It's pretty straightforward. Hold on to that. This metaphor will become useful in a second when we get to the 201. Um, but uh, when you're at the mall, like the longer you're there, maybe the more likely you are to buy something, or maybe the, likely, the more likely you are to get hungry and, and need to brave the food court at the mall. Um, but that's just one metric, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about, about time on, on site and other things that you can measure. All right, here's the meeting. So, um, more precisely, some things I didn't know about sessions, some things that maybe you already know as well, um, but a session begins as soon as the visitor hits the first page on your website and the timer starts. Last half an hour, if they don't do anything, the session ends. If they come back, that's a new session. If they're on another browser, that's another session. If they're on their mobile device, that's another session. Now, there are some ways, more sophisticated ways that you can track and unify that behavior now across mobile and other experiences, um, varying degrees of reliability. Um, but that's at least in principle how the, the sessions work. So uh, at the end of the day, Google Analytics has no idea how long someone has spent on the last page of your website which affects your thinking about sessions because say you're using the mall metaphor, you know, you go to the mall, you spent some time on, in the electronics store, the clothing store, then you go to the food court, you know, and you, have, you spend half an hour in the food court, but that, and, and you leave. When you've left, like, there's nothing to track. You've just, you've gone. So you may have spent one second visiting the home page, and then three hours scrolling up and down this amazing like single page application that's been built, but the timing of your session is gonna be a one second. So focusing only on session duration may not be the most accurate way of thinking about user engagement, if that is your goal, as it is mine. So, a little aha moment for me there. Uh, but what about that? What should we be tracking? You know, I like to think about intent. I like to think about user intent. What are they here to do? Are they achieving what they're seeking to achieve? Um, one way of doing that is focusing on goals. And those goals can help to measure a campaign. Talk a little bit about these notions. Uh, goals are cool. Um, you can create them yourself. We'll look at some of them. And uh, there's also a bunch you can import from uh, the solutions gallery. If you haven't visited the Solutions Gallery before, it's like uh, the, the listing of Drupal modules. There's a lot of them, varying degrees of quality. There's some great stuff out there. There's some junk out there. But people have done it before, and they're sharing with the community. And uh, it's a great place to, to have a start. So what kind of goals do you want to establish on your website? Here are some examples on a, on a typical website. Um, maybe you want people to contact you, visit your enter your contact form and their contact form information. Maybe you have some files that you want them to download. You have a directory and a whole bunch of PDFs, right? Um, maybe you want people to log in, because that's like, you're, you have an intranet, and if no one's logging into your intranet, like, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe you want people to share stuff on social, or play a video. If you set these targets up, these goals, then you can report against them. You can see how many conversions you've had, and you can start to visualize them. In funnels, here's an example funnel visualization of a, uh, a kind of typical e-commerce 
a very simplified e-commerce workflow. People put stuff in a cart and they check them out. This cart may be uh, a membership or a donation or there's other ways of thinking about things than just transactional mercantile data. Um, but there's also this other thing called enhanced e-commerce, which I didn't know about. There's a lot of these like premium products and other things that Google has had. A lot of it's free, but there, one of them is very useful. This enhanced e-commerce report gives you a, a more, uh, a clearer way of being able to track uh, the engagements in the, in the funnel and, and what people are doing along the way. Um, so I encourage you guys to, to check that out. Um, also, you can get these, these nice reports which are more horizontal and more suited to a slide presentation than a vertical uh, image. But, um, but yeah, quite useful. And once you're able to track all this stuff, well, everyone isn't, everyone isn't the same. Everyone's different. Um, but there are some, uh, some types of individuals or some, some characteristics that we may care about more than others on our sites. Um, there are ways of reporting against them. Uh, this uh, is called uh, segmentation, audience segmentation. Uh, and you can report against this inside of Google Analytics, um, building up criteria using um, kind of like a wizard here that lets you add things up. And you can set a, a number of conditions, like show, like filter my, show me what segment of my traffic are, um, you know, Identify, have identified themselves as female between the ages of 25 and 50 in the province of Ontario. And then you can maybe compare that against some other segments and see how people are responding uh, differently to what you're doing and what you're putting out there. Um, and uh, so yeah, they're pretty cool and you can apply them retroactively to all your data, they're non-destructive. How many people are worried about their bounce rate on their website? No? Who knows? How many people uh, have a clear understanding of what bounce rate is? Couple? Okay. All right. So, uh, what is bounce rate? Uh, a bounce rate is when your session is only one page. One page view. So if someone goes, visits your site, and then leaves. They've just gone to see one page. Now, increasingly, um, depending on the nature of your website, but most websites nowadays uh, are seeing an inversion where the home page is, is not necessarily as popular as it was. You know, the longer tail of content is growing, people are entering your website through uh, a search through Google. Maybe they found exactly what they're looking for. They went there, they found something. Fantastic, your job has been well served. Your job, is, your job is done, people are happy, they got what they needed, they read the whole thing. You can check this if you, if you look at how, if they scroll down the whole page, you can validate the, that, that kind of assumption. Um, there's also a bounce that's like, oh, this is not what I was looking for at all. Um, they're in and out. There are also bounces that may be false positives because they're robots that are just kind of like hitting your site and we'll talk a little bit more about how to filter those out. But ultimately, there's no relationship to how long someone's on the website for. It may not be like, oh my goodness, I don't like this, I'm gone. They may be accurately engaged. You can only analyze the data that you have. How is all this stuff structured? Inside of Google Analytics or, you know, inside of Google Analytics, you have, this, this, you have an, an account you can have different accounts, they're bound to an organization. That organization inside of it um, has uh, one or multiple web properties. Each property has a UA code, each account has an account number. You can see the relationship between the account and the property. Uh, the properties will increment. And this is the UA code that you may see when you put the tracking on your website. They ask you for that unique identifier. Um, and that's all you need to start tracking. Although, you know, if anyone else finds your UA code and puts it on their website, then suddenly your analytics accounts are tracking whatever is going on on their website. And <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about how to filter that out, but it happens. You may find like there's some weird stuff in your analytics, like there's some spammers that are doing this kind of stuff now where they, 
they want you to go to, they're targeting you as an analytics user, not the end user of your website to be like curious about what's going on. Why am I getting all this traffic from this stuff? And then you go to their site and then they try to fish you and whatever. Um, okay, but <laughs> that aside, each property has got multiple views. We'll define views in a second. Uh, the default view, when you first install Google Analytics, is called all website data. Fantastic. Um, and each view contains data only from that point forward. You can create more views, but it'll only start collecting information when you press that create button. So it's a good idea if you have that opportunity out of the gate to have a strategy about view creation. We recommend, and most people in the industry recommend having three dedicated views. One, which is your raw data view. This is your unaltered view. Um, it does not, it's, it's not affected by, by any changes that you're going to make to it. It's like a fallback that you can use to see what you may have done to screw things up. And then your master view is what you're going to use for most stuff. And a test view, we have staging and test environments in websites. It's a good idea to not hot dog it. Same thing for your analytics, because ultimately views, um, as they're collecting that information, they're subject to filtering. Filters you can apply to that, to that, uh, that data, and it's gone forever. It's like a sieve. It's not gonna get into your view, which is a good thing. There's stuff you don't want in there. You don't want bot traffic. You don't want um, maybe uh, internal traffic from the IP address of your institution because, um, well, I mean, if you were a university, you, would want that, but if you were, if your audience was outside of, of that space, maybe you, you would want it. Maybe you want to filter out just your IP as the developer because you're putting, you're querying the website like 500 times a day. Um, and you think about where you're going to apply those filters and do it judiciously. Typically, they'd be across the test view and the, the master view. And before you launch something, there's this little button when you create the filters where you can verify the filter. It's non-destructive. It's like a little test. You can see how it's going to affect your data, and if it's good to go, you implement it. Put it on your test view. If it works well, bring that over to the live view. And there's a little checkbox as well that's in every filter that I highly recommend putting in, which is to exclude all hits from known bots and spiders. It's a relatively new feature. It's been out, I think, about two years. Before that, you had to write some complicated regex that filtered out all kinds of conditions and you had like these lists of known bots and things and you were trying to like filter them out manually and new ones would be announced and then you would kind of add them in and you would go and get these snippets. But now it's just a checkbox. So try it out. Should get most things, about 80 to 90% of those bots out of your traffic. Uh, a <laughs> little side note on that, uh, this can be political because someone is looking at their hits Right, and then you turn that on, and suddenly the traffic tanks, and they're like, "Oh my goodness! Like we're, you know, we don't want to lose all this stuff. Now we're not doing as well." But it's it, it's false reporting, so it can affect your your metrics and your year over year comparisons or your month over month comparisons. Uh, another thing that's quite useful is tracking site search. Uh, search is really important because it's, in my in in our view, like the most specific information you could get about user intent on your website. They're looking for something and they're telling you what they're looking for. You can't tell what they're asking if you're not recording it though. So you do need to turn site search on and configure it inside of Google Analytics. And there's a little string you put in there which is the query parameter. Um, this may vary depending on your implementation of search API, native Drupal search, uh, how much you customize it, if you want to remove parts of or you're customizing how that response is. But essentially, you know, it's what you have after that question mark, search equals, and then um, that's what gets sent back to the server to deliver the search results. And then Google can parse all that out and give you a report on what people are searching for. Uh, further, you can connect those kinds of reports, that user intent, uh, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit later, uh, with um, your, with the intent people have when they're searching on Google itself, um, and maybe they're partially finding things, then they use your site search, you can tell a more complete story that way. We'll get back to that. 
Good so far? Yeah? All right. Um, so you may have noticed there are traffic sources inside of your analytics account. Uh, one of them is, is direct. That means someone goes and types the URL in the web browser and goes to your website. It's fantastic. They know who you are. They know where you live. Um, but do you, do you, if you're really active and you're pushing a lot of content out in other sources, in social media, email newsletters, and your direct traffic is still really high, um, may, maybe that's not an accurate representation of how people are getting to your, to your website. Because you're promoting your website, maybe it's in your email signature, maybe it's in like all these sources you're pushing out, and you're promoting your homepage. People are getting there. It looks like they're typing it in the browser, but they're just clicking a link, and that looks like direct traffic. But it's not. It's actually coming from a different source that you've promoted. Well, how do you track that? Uh, UTM parameters are the way to do it. Um, so UTM stands for Urchin Tracking something? Metrics? Mechanism? Uh, analytics bought this thing called Urchin like way, way back when, and uh, they just kept, they kept the name. So it's kind of a bit of a, a legacy, uh, legacy of, of analytics acquisition. Uh, and this is the syntax. You can see them when you click on things. Here's uh, uh, a, a, like a MailChimp link. These will get formulated out of MailChimp for you, potentially. And uh, so here would be you know, your homepage. But then after the question mark, you have this UTM source. All these, these parameters, they, the order isn't necessarily important, but the properties are. So the source in this case, where is the traffic coming from? It's coming from MailChimp. What medium is it coming from? It's coming from email. And what campaign? It's our newsletter campaign. With this data coming into Google Analytics, you can then start to segment and understand where people are coming from and how they're behaving. And, and also, if you have a campaign, like which medium is more potent? Is it social? Is it mail? What's driving more traffic? So you can build on that success, meet people where they're at. There is a hierarchy to the consideration you should bring to your UTM uh, strategy. Um, the campaign is the, the most important thing. It is the highest level grouping conceptually of um, how you're going to segment that data. Uh, after that, the medium is important. I'll follow this with some tips uh, about um, how, to, how to do this. Now, these are all just things that you need to make up. This terminology is, it's not like a drop down select natively. You have to type this stuff in. So strategy is going to be important here. Um, social, email, these are some examples. We'll talk a bit more about that. And then the source. You know, helps you to segment that. Uh, the the terms these are useful if you're doing AdWords. If you're not doing AdWords, you don't, don't need to worry about that. And uh, content is also uh, optional. But this can help you bring more focus. Say you have a web page and you've got multiple links to the same uh, the same thing that you're referring to. One's a button. One's uh, like an advertisement. You might want to know what content is driving, from the same source in the same medium, what content is driving that traffic. So your newsletter may have a call to action. It may have a link that's just embedded in the text to the same destination. And this will help you know what's most successful. Yes? Uh, MD blog, that means that uh, you have control on MD blog. Like MD blog, for instance, in that example, mm -hmm. it's MD that will put uh, that will put the actual uh, UTM tags to your site. Is that correct? So uh, UTM links, you can create them. Other people can use them. You can send them out to someone to use. Um, exactly. And then you would specify what you want to track, because this is what you're going to be getting inside of your analytics account. Uh, some people do that for you. Uh, does anyone subscribe to the weekly drop? Yes, you may notice that, and you may have written some blog posts that are on the weekly drop, and they put their own UTM links in there, and they tell you that the source is going to be the weekly drop. Mm -hmm. That way, when you're in your analytics, you can start to see the value of, of what they're providing. And, and you can do that, um, too, to, to others in sending those links. And these are arbitrary. Um, that They're arbitrary to your particular use case. Um, so if, you're, if you have a blog in your end, you have multiple blogs. Max has a blog. Andy has a blog. Um, those would be where you would, you would specify that. Did that answer your question? Enough? Yeah. Come back to it. 
So some best practices around UTM generation. Um, it's really important that everyone get on the same page around, around this and that it be socialized because, well, a couple things. Um, UTM parameters are case sensitive. So one, like someone capitalizes email, someone uses lowercase e, someone uses a dash, suddenly you've got all these different sources um, and you're segmenting your traffic inappropriately. There are ways you can fix that after the fact, but it's just a hassle, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you want to track how you're doing it. You want to standardize how you're going about it. If you have established these conventions, then um, document them and enforce them. There are a number of spreadsheets that you can use that have some templates and little drop downs to create these links. Set in the back, you decide what all your parameters are. You, you kind of like list them out and then when users want to create a UTM link, they just have a drop down. You can go, Google has a generator. You can Google UTM generator, but you still have to type those things in. And then you don't know what is in use. So having a catalog of them so you can see what the rest of your team is doing and, and be on top of it is a good idea. So there are some services. Uh, there's, there's quite a, there are quite a few of them. Uh, some of them are, have good free, free enough models. Uh, spreadsheets are, are, are a pretty good way to, uh, to do this. Um, also don't use spaces. Uh, in your any of your parameters, use dashes in between all your words if you have multiple words. Uh, and don't use special characters. Ampersands will really mess things up because that's what segments the different parameters from one another. So, you know, if your newsletter is called Cookies and Cream, uh, you might want to replace that ampersand with a dash or an and. Or and um, also, if you're using ads, don't use UTM links for Google Ads. They, they get created automatically for you. So you don't need to, when you're linking out from that ad and you're doing your outbound link from it, um, just, just put the URL in, they'll, they'll all be created uh, manually. Uh, then when you're, when you're thinking about social, um, yeah, there's a lot of different socials. There's Facebook, there's Twitter and everything, but uh, we found like just, just having a broad category for social it is is usually pretty pretty good because um, you know specific content is going to be uh, in the source um, and that's kind of it for UTMs. Search Console. Does anyone use Search Console right now? A couple people. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty quick hookup. I encourage you to try it out. Uh, it's another Google product. It used to be called Webmaster Tools. You may be more familiar with that. Now it's called Search Console. And uh, what it does is it helps you understand organic search performance. You can only track what happens when someone's on your website, but with Search Console you can see what they're actually typing into Google to search and connect that story between the two spaces. You can also understand better what they're searching and how it ranks against your competitors. And where the key, where the keyword, what the keyword rankings are, uh, for what they're actually looking for. So it tells a big, big part of the beginning of that story, and uh, the performance uh, of of, uh, of search ultimately. Now the thing about Search Console to know is the data is not super fresh. It's not live. It's like 48 hour. There's a 48 hour delay, uh, and the the data is only held for 16 months. So, you know, it's still pretty good. Year you can do year over year reports. Uh, but I highly encourage you to do this. It's pretty quick and easy. Um, just that, and, you know, you can use your Google Analytics account to connect it to your Search Console pretty quickly. How many people use Google Tag Manager? All right, great. Google Tag Manager is the bomb. Uh, it's great. It's fantastic. So. You know, you got to install your tracking code on your website. You can use a module for it, right? There's the, the analytics module that, that Drupal has. Um, but then if you want to do any kind of customization, um, you're pushing code up to production, and then there's delays. And with a lot of the stuff, depending on the size of your team and their influence, you know, marketing may have uh, a, a big role to play here. And, and Google Tag Managers, Manager allows you to empower marketing to, to manage tags on your website. Well, what are tags? We'll get into that in a second. But one of the really great uh, valuable things about Tag Manager is it lets you manage 
Mits manage Google Analytics, you install Google Tag Manager on your site instead of Google Analytics, then Google Tag Manager has a web interface, then you plug your Google Analytics into that. And more, other stuff. I was mentioning Hotjar earlier, Crazy Egg AdWords, all these other tracking, all these other scripts, third-party scripts, you can just manage through a tag manager. That means you're not pushing a bunch of code up, but most importantly, all those requests are being done asynchronously, so you're not slowing down the performance of your website as much, and it's less costly to be trying out you know, new, new stuff that might otherwise be blocking the rendering of your page. Um, they have a UI inside of there that you can use to track specific kinds of behaviors. Tags, triggers, and variables are the terminology that are used. We'll look at those uh, in a second. But it lets you track other things that Google Analytics doesn't natively track. You can track file downloads, um, but you can't segment across which type of file. With some uh, help through Google Tag Manager, you can tell how many people are downloading PDFs, Excel documents, PowerPoints, and report against those if that's useful to you. Um, you can also track the types of clicks most differently. Are people clicking on a phone number? Are they clicking on an email address? Analytics doesn't know anything about this unless you tell it. So Google Tag Manager can help you manage that information and push more interesting data into Google Analytics for analysis. How is that done? It's done through what's called a data layer, which sits on top of your website, some JavaScript that tells you what you're sending to analytics, and that can be done through this UI, or it can be done in a more custom way that's a little bit more performant and more like Cody. Um, and that lets you say, okay, like here's a button and we're gonna call it this and here's the click, or maybe you have a custom UI and there's like a dial you need to change and you wanna know when stuff's at 25, 50, 75%. Google Analytics isn't gonna know anything about that, but that is an important part of your conversion metrics. You know, how much are people engaging? How many steps are they going through your process? on the page if you have a dynamic page and there's like a lot of Ajax, so you're not like reloading the page and there's a bunch of, you're not visiting multiple URLs in the steps of your process, you want to be telling Google Analytics, oh, people are 25, 50, 75% of the way through the process that we've set up for them versus zero or 100 by the time they've completed the, the process. Um, here's an example of some tags. Uh, a lot of these are, again, uh, things that you can import that are already done. There's a bunch of libraries and other stuff, and it'll, it'll get you going. Um, so uh, Luna Metrics has this tracking plugin for YouTube. It'll tell you how far people have watched through a video. Not, you know, it's pretty cool. Did they watch the whole thing? Halfway, 25%. Um, file downloads, email clicks, outbound links. Outbound versus inbound link can, can be interesting to know what, what, what people are using your site for. Is it a resource to go elsewhere, or are they really invested in the content that you have there? Oh, and scroll depth. Earlier we were showing the Hotjar stuff. Um, so these scripts will give you some basic uh, analytics about how far people have scrolled down the page inside of Google Analytics, and all for free, too. It's cool. Oops. Uh, meant to be Google Data Studio. Has anyone here used Google Data Studio before? A couple people. Uh, how many people are uh, at least familiar with Data Studio? A couple. Okay. This comp competition for this t-shirt is, is going to be uh, limited because I mentioned Google Data Studio <laughs> earlier. Uh, Google Data Studio is like analytics meets PowerPoint. It makes your analytics more digestible. And what time is this thing supposed to end? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> All right. Let's do bonus content. You guys okay? I got like five more minutes, power through this. Uh, so here's a dashboard. Uh, there's an ecosystem. You can build all these connectors. Earlier, you know, Google Search Console is giving you stuff in Analytics, GTM is giving you stuff inside of Google Analytics, but there are other properties that you have, other kinds of engagement, and you can merge all that data together inside of a dashboard. You can pull stuff from your social metrics, from other things. There's some third-party connectors in this ecosystem that will let you build and report against this. If you have like five different websites, you have to go and log into five different Google Analytics accounts. You can take those metrics, put them on one single dashboard and see how everything's performing against each other. It's kind of nifty. Also it gives you that high level perspective that empowers decision makers um, to know how things are doing, to celebrate your victories, uh, give you a raise and all that stuff. Um, there are other alternatives to Google as well. Here are a couple. Uh, Power BI, Databox, 
a lot of great free stuff on the Databox tier. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, Tableau uh, just purchased recently by Salesforce for $15.7 billion. Uh, so maybe something valuable in there. It's all stock though, don't worry. But uh, th this lets you do like on-premise analysis of data and visualizations. It's pretty cool. Uh, they have great pro uh, pricing for nonprofits as well. And Power BI is more of a Microsoft-y thing. If you're on Windows, if you're on Windows, then then you can consider that. And then Google Analytics is not the end all and be all. Mat Matomo, which used to be Piwik, is an open source uh, version, and you can also host it on premises. So you're not sending all your data out to Big Brother. Uh, Adobe has also got an analytics platform, which is part of the marketing cloud. These are alternatives that you can pursue. A lot of the concepts are similar. Some are a little bit different um, than the things that we uh, saw before. Uh, if you want to learn more, here are uh, two good resources. One, there's a demo account. If you go to this website, it'll put a new property uh, inside of your Google Analytics account, and it connects you directly to the Google Store. You get all their analytics, all that data. You don't need to worry about messing up your website data. You can see how it's all been done. You can play around with it. You can do stuff that's non-destructive. This is how, it's a great way to learn. Break it, but uh, not yours. Break someone else's. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another resource. If you want to do the e enhanced e-commerce tracking, there are some examples of how to implement data layers at this website, enhancedecommerce.appspot.com. Uh, and last, uh, here's a PDF. It's like three pages of a lot of the tips and tricks that I was showing here, uh, it's very printable. You can read it on the Metro. You can uh, give it to someone else. Uh, bit.ly slash ga dash tips dash eight. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Um. <clears throat> Do you have experience with uh, GDPR and Google Analytics? Uh, some. Uh, what are you? What are, What are you concerned about? Okay, uh, a client that that uh, has uh, uh, visitors from Europe, and mm -hmm. you want to put Google Analytics under restriction. Can you give them the yes. So there's a lot of power with Google Analytics. You can use custom variables to to record a lot of things. You can, if you want to push email addresses from your logged in users to Google Analytics. You can pass identifiable information into Google Analytics. It's up to you to be compliant. You can break the rules. Now, uh, there are ways to opt out of tracking, and that is respected now in all browsers. Um, and um, in terms of GDPR, you know, Google is, is really up on that. You want to be telling people you're tracking them generally um, if you have European visitors, and there are ways of doing that. There's a, a good resource, there's a, a little product that we, we've gotten interested in called Cookie Pro, and it, it gives you a banner on top of your website, analyzes all the cookies, and then people can opt in or out. It's starting to like make some waves around there. It's a pretty easy way of, of doing that kind of alert. Check it out. Um, yeah, some people have to go. Uh, so, uh, question. Um, all right. Uh, what are the what are the two locations where Calhoun is based? Great. All right, you win. You can come up later after you teacher. Um, any any other questions? Who did you cheer for last night? Pardon? Who did I cheer for? Oh, well, I won either way, so, you know. Uh, I, I, was, I was cheering for the Raptors because, um, I, you know, it was, this, is the, this is the time to be in Canada, right? Uh, so, for sure, yeah. Long time, long time coming. Uh, but the, the Warriors, their practice stadium is right outside of our office. Like, you can see the window, and it says, like, Warriors, and they're, like, they're right there every day, like, staring at us. So... Um, you know, I'll send them my condolences, I guess. <laughs> Feel free to be in touch. I'll be around uh, till the end of the day and uh, on the internet forever. <laughs> Thanks.